Hey, aren't you glad that we have over 300 teenage years at a retreat in Jesus' name? <laughs> Seeking after God. Good things happening. Praise God for that. And uh, I just want to say that we're very grateful for our youth leaders and volunteers. There's over 50 youth leaders and volunteers that are up there investing in our youth. They're uh, some of them got very little sleep last night, I'm sure. And let me just give a shout out to one of our uh, volunteers that actually works on security here. When the youth gathered on Friday to get ready to go to the retreat, a lot of people parked in the parking lot, left their cars there. They didn't realize that the next day we had a food pantry in that same parking lot. And so someone called panicking, saying, hey, we got a bunch of cars in the parking lot. We got to feed a couple thousand people tomorrow. And so one of our youth leaders named Job, he made his way all the way up, drove all the way an hour and a half down here, moved all the cars because he collected the keys up there, moved all the cars and then drove all the way back there and only got three hours of sleep. So, yeah. And yesterday, uh, there was close to 2,000 people that were fed through our food pantry. If you participated in that, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be a part of a church that rolls up its sleeves and serves people in Jesus' name. Uh, one other thank you I want to give on behalf of the family of the officer that was part of this New Life family that was shot last week, Carlos Janez. And his family just wanted to express thank you. The family is very appreciative that uh, we have been praying for his recovery. Continue to pray. He's still in very critical condition in the ICU unit. And uh, it's a miracle that he's alive. But we're continuing to pray for his recovery. And thank you for doing so. Yeah, thank you. I want you to take your Bibles today. And turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 21. I want to talk to you about the power within you. The power within you. You know, there are times when something loses power that really it ceased to be useful. It ceases to operate in the way that it should when it loses power. Not too long ago, my wife and I were on a trip and I was on the way to the airport and I looked at my smartphone and I realized, uh-oh, the battery is low on this. And I had my boarding pass on my phone and, I, and, and, and my battery was getting lower, it was already on the red. And I thought, oh no, if I lose power, I will have trouble getting on the plane, I'll have trouble finding the place that I'm going to. I won't be able to call up my contacts there or say bye to my family. Uh-oh, if this device loses power, then it's basically useless. And so when I got to the airport, I'm searching around for a plug. I'm looking, where can I find a plug to plug this device? Because if it loses power, it loses its usefulness. If you have a smartphone that loses its power, what are you going to use it for? A door stopper? Cup holder? Many of our lives are that way. Many of us don't understand that there is a power that's been given to us, an internal power. And that when you have that power, when you access that power, when you're living in that power, when that power dwells in you and is energizing your life, then what you can do and how can God can use you is unlimited. But when you lose that power, you operate at, at far less than your calling. So I need you to listen up today because I believe that some people today are living their lives without the power that God has called them to live in. 
You have access to power that you don't know, and it's a power that resides within you. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. I'm going to talk to you about four aspects that you need to understand about the inner power that's inside of you. Four things you need to understand about this power addressed in this prayer. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, power to embrace the life-changing presence of Christ. It tells us in verse 14, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to a group of believers that lived in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was a very pagan city, a lot of idolatry, a lot of chaos. Paul is speaking to them, and he was addressing them because he knew that many of them were not living with the power inside of them activated. And so he says, for this reason, he prays a prayer all about power. I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with... I got half of you awake here. He says, let's try this again, verse 16. I pray that through his spirit in your inner being... Let's go for verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with... There you go. Through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Let me break this down for you. The apostle Paul starts by saying, I bow my knees. You know, we can pray any way we need to pray, but there are certain times, especially at key occasions, when we want to show God that we are humbled before him, when there is an intense petition, that we don't just pray by bowing our head or by closing our eyes or even by raising our hands. But there are certain prayers that are so important, so crucial, so vital, that we are so earnest that there are certain prayers that are best prayed on our knees. Paul says, I kneel, I bow my knee before the Father. You know, when proposals are made for engagements, the standard position is that the man would get on one knee. Why? It's a sign of, I am very earnestly, sincerely asking for something. It's a sign of earnestness that this is not just a regular occasion. On regular occasions, you kind of just speak face to face. But when you're asking something that is important, it's special, then you get on your knee. Paul is bowing himself on his knees at this special occasion because he has something very important that he's asking of God, and it's all about empowering. So he asks for power to embrace the presence of Christ. And he says, verse, uh, look what he says, for this reason I bow before the Father. By the way, when we pray, some pe sometimes people ask me, Pastor Mark, when I pray, Am I praying to God the Father? Am I praying to Jesus? Am I praying to the Holy Spirit? And I always like to explain it to them. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all involved in your prayer. But technically, you pray to God the Father. You have access to God the Father in Jesus' name. That's why when we close our prayers, we say, I pray this in Jesus' name. Because it's Jesus' death on the cross that allows us to come before the Father uh, and allows us to petition before the Father. And it's the Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us in how to pray and what to pray and when to pray. So we pray to God the Father through Jesus the Christ 
empowered by the Holy Spirit. Are you tracking with me here? All right. So he says, for this reason, I bow before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. By the way, this is not what the message is about, but there's an allusion to unity. He says, we have family in heaven and family on earth, and we're all united by the same name. Those that have gone before us and people here on earth, in Africa, in Asia, in South America, in North America, black, brown, white, Asian, one family together, united by something that's stronger than blood, united by the spirit of the living Jesus, gathered together as one family coming before the Father. And then he says in verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, uh, how rich is God? He's infinitely rich. How many resources does God have? He has no limit to his resources. In fact, someone could say his glorious riches. In other words, this is unfathomable what he has. There's no shortage. There's no bankruptcy ever with God. There is no, oh, I don't have it. God always has plentiful resources, abundant resources. And so he says, I'm praying that out of God's glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power. Many of you know that the Bible was, the New Testament was written in the Greek language. It was the common language of the day. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew and Aramaic, which was the language of the Hebrew people. But the New Testament was written in ancient Greek because it was the common language of the day. And so there are two words in the Greek here, strengthen with power. Strengthen means to become strong, and power is the Greek word dunamis. Dunamis is where we get the word dynamite from. So he says, this is what he's saying, that you may become strong in the might, power, or strength, or capability through his spirit. In other words, I want you to grow in strength in the power that you have inside of you. You have power, but some of you have a battery that's on red. He said, I'm praying that you grow in power that your inner power would become much greater than what it is, that you would find your inner power growing and growing and growing, where does that inner power come from? Through what? His spirit in your inner being. Again, let me just explain this to you a little bit so that we're all on the same page. When the Bible talks about his spirit, it's talking about capital S spirit. In other words, Holy Spirit. The King James, uh, some of you that are used to that language call it the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. You and I, we are beings that have body, soul, and spirit. So we have a spirit, small s spirit. You are a spirit being. That part of you that connects with the spiritual world is your spirit. When your body dies, you still have a spirit. That spirit is eternal. Every human being is eternal. Their soul and their spirit is eternal. You were born with a spirit being. You have a spirit inside of you. The Holy Spirit, capital S, is the third person of the Godhead, and it's the Holy Spirit that connects with your spirit. Jesus said that he had to leave so that the Holy Spirit could come. The coming of the Holy Spirit happened on the day of Pentecost. 120 people were gathered in an upper room. Jesus told his disciples after the resurrection that he was leaving. They gathered together and prayed. As they prayed together, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. Jesus said, I have to go so that the Holy Spirit will come. The Holy Spirit is the power of God that dwells on every believer. He's in the Greek, he's called the paraclete, your coach, your helper, your strengthener. If you are a believer in Jesus the Christ, 
You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You wake up in the morning, the Holy Spirit is with you. You walk throughout the day, the Holy Spirit is with you. He convicts you. He challenges you. He guides you. He tells you what's right and what's wrong. He makes you feel bad when you do certain things. He empowers you at other times. When you go to worship, he stirs up inside of you so you want to cry out, Abba, Father. He opens up your eyes so you understand the scripture. He brings you to repentance when your heart is hard. He puts impressions upon your heart. He tells you how to pray. He guides you. He empowers you. He's with you. You cannot live your life without the power of the Holy Spirit. It tells us in Scripture, Paul is saying, I want you to be strengthened with the power through his Spirit in your inner being. The reason that he's talking about your inner being is that you and I, our inner man, we have what's called the flesh and the Spirit. The flesh is constantly battling with the spirit. Have you felt that battle? Even if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, Paul says, I've crucified the flesh. So the flesh is being put to death, but the flesh still raises its ugly head. The flesh is your unbridled desires for that which satisfies your own flesh in an egotistical, selfish way. The flesh drives you to want pornography. The flesh drives you to want to be unfaithful. The flesh drives you to hate, to unforgiveness. The flesh drives you to overindulgent. This flesh drives you to want to do a line of cocaine. The flesh drives you to things that are apart from God. The spirit drives you to God. The flesh drives you away from God. There's a constant battle waging within your being. It's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. How many felt that battle this week? How many felt that battle this morning? How many feeling that battle right now? There is a constant war that is being raged, waged within your soul, your inner being, between the flesh and the spirit. When you walk in the spirit, you subdue the flesh. When you walk in the flesh, you quench the spirit. You can be a believer that walks in the flesh and you're quenching the spirit. Or you can be a believer that walks in the spirit and you have dominance over the flesh. When you have dominance over the flesh, that means that you're living the life of God. That means that there's joy, the fruit of the spirit. You're walking in victory. When you allow the flesh to dominate your life, You, as a believer, you quench the spirit, and so the spirit grieves inside of you. You may be a believer right now that is dominated by the flesh, and so you do not feel joy. You do not feel the power of God, because although you have the power inside of you, the power is minimal because you allow the flesh to dominate your inner being. Someone asked me a while back, Pastor, well, how do you help the spirit overcome the flesh? And I said to this person, it depends on who you feed the most. When you feed the flesh, you strengthen the power of the flesh, and so the flesh dominates the spirit. When you feed the spirit, you strengthen the spirit, and the spirit dominates the flesh. Are you with me here? You say, Pastor, I don't know why. I'm just so weak. And I try to overcome temptation. I keep falling. I don't know. I don't know what's, what's, what's going on with me. I, I, just, I just can't seem to have the inner strength. My question is, what have you been eating? And I'm not talking about physical Paco's tacos, carnitas al pastor. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what are you 
feeding your spirit. You say, well, I, I have been been watching some telenovelas. Okay, well, you know, and, and, and I, I've picked up the Bible occasionally. But you know, whatever you're feeding, if you're feeding the flesh, gossip, listening, programs, and you seldom feed the spirit, whatever you feed the most is going to be the strongest in your life. So you need to ask yourself this question, what are you feeding? Because your level of victory is directly related to what you feed the most. You want greater spiritual victory than start feeding the spirit, meditating on scripture, get into praise, get into good conversations, get into a Bible study, uh, focus on the things that are of God and, and, and meditate and learn and grow. Let your mind dwell on that which is healthy and holy and uh, make sure that your spirit is inducted in praise. Make sure that you're thanking God. Make sure that you're praying. Make sure that you're opening up your Bible. Make sure that you're getting exposed. Make sure that your spirit is getting stronger within you so that it can overcome the flesh and dominate the flesh. And by the way, I simply want to say that if you're here today, and that you are, you have been around religion. Religion is not a list of rules of do's and don'ts, and you in your own power trying to live out a good moral life. That's called morality, or that's called ethics. Christianity is not about being a moralist. Christianity is not being uh, just ethical, although when you're, when you're a Christian and living out your life, you have high standards of morality. This is not about you following a rule book. If you have embraced religion, then it means that you're trying to change your life on your own power and live up to God's standards. And I can guarantee you this, you will fail. There will be no joy. You will fail and you'll walk away saying, I tried religion and it didn't work for me. Christianity is when you submit yourself to God and allow him to wash you and let the power of the spirit of God come inside of you and let his spirit from the inside out begin to transform you and change you in ways that you could never change yourself. This is about God's work in you, not your work on yourself. Until you grasp that, you will fail. And unless... And if you succeed temporarily at changing your life by your own power, then you get all the glory. When you realize that you cannot change your life and that you need the power of God to change you, and you bow yourself on your knees and you say, I cannot change my, not myself. I need the power of the living God. Come, Lord Jesus, and do what I cannot do. Then all the glory goes to God. You will raise your hands in praise and give him all the honor and the glory that he deserves. It's about God and not about you. And so the apostle Paul says, I pray that you have power to be able to strengthen the inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Number two, not only power to embrace the life-changing presence of Christ, but power to grasp the four-dimensional or multi-dimensional love of God. He says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have, let's say it again, may have what? Power. May have power together with all the saints that you and I, we're called saints, believers in Jesus, to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. I wish I could preach this better than I can, but let me, let me try to preach it for you. This is the secret to stability and strength in your life. 
If you are here today and you say, Pastor, my, my spiritual life is like a roller coaster. I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down. I'm passionate, then I, I lose it. I'm inconsistent. I come real strong, then I fall away. Let me tell you, it's probably related to this. Let me break it down. He says, I pray that you being rooted and established. That, root, that word rooted is like a tree that develops deep roots in the ground. And established is the imagery of a building that's secure, strong. So what the Apostle Paul is saying is, I want you to be deeply grounded, and I want you to be firm in your spiritual life. I pray that you being rooted and established, deeply grounded in what? In love. That you may have power with all the saints to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep is what? The love of Christ. Now let me break this down for a moment. When I say to you that God loves you, most of you would nod your head and say, yeah, God loves you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Most people have a mental assent to the fact and knowledge that God loves you. But many people have never experienced the love of God. I have a conversation with people all the time that tell me, Pastor, in my head I know the verse that God loves me, but I don't feel like he loves me. I have this conversation all the time. When you say the Father loves me, my image of my own father is a father that never embraced me, that never looked at me in the eyes and said, hey, I love you. My image of a father is someone that is dictatorial, hard, harsh, demanding, looking for me to make a mistake, to point it out, distant emotionally, harsh, judgmental. And so when you say, accept the love of the father, I have a disconnect because I have never had a father that loved me. Some of you fathers right now, are trying to break a cycle with your children that your father gave down to you. I'll never forget at a men's encounter retreat. A father came up weeping as we talked about the love of God and the importance to be channels of that love. And I said, what's, what's wrong? And in front of all the men that were there weeping, he said, I have a 11 year old, a nine year old, a five year old, and a three year old. They're all daughters. He said, I'm ashamed to say, I've never told them I love you. He says, I'm ashamed to say, I, I feel awkward hugging them. I'm ashamed to say that I'm just repeating the cycle of what my father gave to me. You see, my father never hugged me. My father never said he loved me. My father was distant. He was this stern, macho male that never expressed emotions. And he broke as he realized the damage that he was producing to his daughters. Can I tell you something? You can't give what you haven't received. And some of you have never received the love of the Father because you've never experienced the love of the Father. You don't know how to give love because you have not received love. The Apostle Paul is praying for the Ephesian believers that they would be a breakthrough in their life, that they would experience not just the head knowledge of love, but that they would experience and grasp the power of love. And he says something very interesting. He says that they would grasp the, well, he calls it a multidimensional love. 
How wide, long, high, deep is the love of God? It's almost like you have to put on the 3D glasses and see that it's not just flat, but it's multidimensional. When he speaks about the width of God's love, I think he's referring to all that God covers. God's love is not just for a narrow group of people. God's love covers a lot of people. God, God's love doesn't just cover part of your life and part of your sin. God's love covers everything in your life. God's love is wide. It covers a breadth of humanity and a breadth of your life. There's nothing beyond the love of God in your life because it is wide, not narrow. Secondly, you need to understand that the love of God is long. What does he mean by long? I think that by long it means that when did it start, when does it end? Listen, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God has always existed before there was matter, before there was time, before there was a concept of the universe. God existed, and He always has existed with the centrality of love. He didn't grow to be a loving being. He's always been a loving being. He didn't evolve to love. Love has always been at the heart of who he is. It's ingrained in his character. It's, he is immutable, which means that God never changes. And so God has always loved. This incomprehensible, powerful love has been there before we could ever imagine that it was there. And it's infinite into the future. And it will never stop. It will never end. It will go on forever and ever. That's the love of God. And how high is the love of God? The love of God reaches into the very depths and it raises people from the de very depth of the muck and mire and takes us out of the muck and mire, washes us off. He loves us in an unconditional, powerful way. And that love lifts us up into his presence to the very throne room of God. He takes that which is broken, despised, toxic, that which is dysfunctional, and that which has been mired in sin. And he lifts us up to the very holy of holies into the very presence of the Most High God. That is how high the love of God goes. And you say, well, how, how deep is the love of God? How deep is the love of God? In Philippians chapter 2, it tells us that Jesus, being God, humbled himself and became like a man and humbled himself in obedience and died on a cross and shed blood and was buried and suffered in humanity because he went as deep and as low as he could for our love. That's how deep the love of God is. And let me just say this. Paul says, I want the power of the Holy Spirit to help you understand how powerful the love of God is. Can I tell you something today? What drives me to live for God is not the fear of hell and damnation. That's a negative motivation. What really causes us to overcome sin, makes me passionate about God, want, makes me want to live holy, is not the fear of hell and damnation. What makes me want to live for God is the incomprehensible knowledge of his incredible love for me and the grace that he has poured out while we didn't deserve his love he's loved us while we weren't worthy of it he's poured out his love and grace and mercy upon us and it makes me want to live for God not because I'm afraid of hell but because I love God and what he's done in my life and I'm so grateful that he has reached out in his grace and mercy it is the grace of God the Bible says that teaches us to say no to sin It's like the young man growing up on the streets of Chicago. The fear of jail and imprisonment can only do so much. But a young man who has a father in his life and the father says, son, this is who you are. This is, this is, 
This is who you are. You're a man. You have dignity. You have worth. You're a leader. You take initiative. Take responsibility. He's inspired by manhood instead of deterred by prison. The challenge of our city and the challenge of, of Chicago has less to do with prison and law enforcement and has much more to do with leadership in the household, models and mentoring in our very own living rooms, men and women that speak into the life and destiny that mentor young men and teach them what it means to be a young man, not a hoodlum, but a young man that walks with honor and respect, that knows how to treat a woman, that walks with temperance and discipline because they've been inspired by a man that poured into their life and let them know that they have a future and a destiny because they were a man that was present in their lives. And so it is with the love of God. It's not hell that motivates us. It's the love of a father, powerful love of a father that inspires us to live in a different way. Number three, the power to experience this overflowing love. Notice what it says in verse 19. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. Can I break this down for you? The love of God is not something that you simply know intellectually. You need to experience it to know it. He says, I want you to know the love of God, but you can't just grasp it with your mind. You have to experience it with your heart and with your spirit. Have you ever tried to explain an experience to someone and then you discover that your words can't quite explain it and you just have to say, you need to experience it yourself? Has that ever happened to you? Before I had a baby, fathers would try to tell me the feeling of being a father and what it felt like and the emotions. I would say, yeah. No, you don't understand. Yeah, I think I do. I didn't understand. Until I held my daughter for the first time in my arms and thought, this is my baby, my little girl, mine, flesh of my flesh, and held her, and the heart of a father was birthed until I experienced it. I didn't really fully grasp it. I went skydiving with that little girl when she turned 20 because she said, Dad, let's do it. And so I jumped out of a plane with her. Since it was her birthday, I let her go first. <laughs> you know, I'm a gentleman. I just, honey, I think you should go first. Now, I could explain to someone, try to explain to someone what it feels like falling out of an airplane at 13,000 feet in the air. But let me tell you, you got to experience it to really know what it feels like. I can describe it, but unless you experience it, you can't quite experience it. And what Paul is saying is I could describe the love of God. I could paint a picture about the love of God. I could sing a song about the love of God. I could try to articulate the love of God with eloquence and flowery speech. I could diagram the love of God. I could get the deepest theologians together to try to explain the, the grandiose power and depth of his love. I could try to explain the difference between agapeo love and filial love and eros love. And you could fill a notebook full of it, but you would not even begin to scratch a personal understanding until you yourself, in your spirit, with your soul, have experienced personally 
the overflowing power of the love of God in your life. And here's what Paul says. I pray that you would know the love that surpasses knowledge. In other words, what he's saying, I pray that you experience the love that you cannot describe, that you cannot explain. I want you not to know it up here, but I want you to feel it right here. Undescribable, insurpassable, a love that overflows that you know this is God. You cannot give what you have not received. And some of you are at a place in your life right now that you know about the love of God, but you have, you have allowed lies to hinder your experience of that love. You've allowed the enemy to put a cap on that love. You see other people worshiping and you think, I don't get it. Other people talk about it and you haven't experienced it. There are women in this auditorium that are so deeply void of the love of a father that you have made many, many bad choices about men because what you really long for deep inside is the love of a father. And you found yourself in relationship after bad relationship thirsting for male approval, thirsting for affirmation, desirous of love without understanding that you're chasing after the love of a father and that there's no man on earth, boyfriend, husband, or friend that can ever satisfy a vacuum that only God can satisfy within your soul and being. And so I pray along with the Apostle Paul today that if you're a man, if you'd never experienced it, that God would break through the lies of you don't deserve it, that you're not worthy, that you never measure up and experience this love that like a waterfall that just overwhelms you and overwhelms your senses and shatters your preconception and breaks down your barriers so that you know without a shout of a doubt that the heavenly father that doesn't have to love me has chosen to love me and that you are transformed by the powerful inundating love of your father. And Paul says, I pray for that dunamis, that energy, that power so that you can experience that love, that you may be filled with the measure of the fullness of God. You see, when you don't experience that love, you can't be filled with the measure of the fullness of God. That God would fill your being from the inside out. That you would be full of God, the fullness of his measure. That means that he would fill you to the utmost capacity, to the brim, so that you would be filled with the love of God and the joy of God and the power of God and the essence of God so that you would be up to the top of your brim filled with the love of God because you've experienced it. And once you grasp his love, he can fill you with all of who he is so that you are filled with the Holy Spirit, overcoming the flesh, speaking into the life of your children and your wife as a, as a mother and a wife, being able to not only receive love, but give love because you've experienced the powerful love of God. And I know you say, well, pastor, I wish that would happen to me, but I don't even know what that looks like. I want that to happen to me, but I, I'm not even sure in my mind what that even looks like. And I don't know how to pray. And that leads me to my fourth and last point, the power to live way beyond what we imagine. Verse 20 says, now to him who to Christ, Jesus now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, that means you can't even measure how much more it is. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more 
than all that we ask or imagine. You don't even know how to pray. And God says, I can do in you beyond what you could even imagine I could do or even ask. You're not even asking. You have this little prayer, but I'm going to answer with a big prayer. You have this thought of how I could be as a husband, as a father, as an individual. You don't even know what I could do in your life. You don't even know how I can transform you. You can't even fathom how, how I can make you, how I can melt your heart to love people that have hurt you, how I can, how I can change you and the compassion that you can have when you never thought you could be compassionate, how I can make you a man of God when you viewed yourself always as, a, as, as way, way far than a man of God. You can even wear the label of a man of God, but how I can change you so that you could be a man of God or a woman of God that walks in dignity and power and value, that knows God, that oozes the presence of God. I can work in you and transform you in ways that you didn't, can't even imagine I could transform you. And he says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine, according to what? According to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church or his people and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to close with an altar call and with homework. I'm going to ask that you stand with me. Let me give you your homework first. I want to challenge you between now and the end of this month if you really are serious about experiencing the love of God and increasing in inner power, I want to challenge you that between now and the end of this month, that every day you would find a time that you would get on your knees, because Paul said, I bow my knees, and that you would pray this prayer over your life. Something like this. I bow my knees before you, Father. Because my name belongs to you. And I'm connected with so many other people who have you as the Father. And I pray, God, since you have no limit in your resources, that you would strengthen me with inner energy and power through your spirit so that my spirit would start to overcome the flesh. And so that Christ will live in my heart through faith. And I pray that you would root me and ground me in love and that I would have power with all your people to grasp in a fresh new way how wide, how long, how deep, and how high your love is for me. I want to know your love, God, not just in my head, but experience it. And I want to know that love that I cannot grasp so that it fills me to all the measure, the fullness of you, Father. And I know that you can do way beyond what I could ask or imagine, so I ask that you would do it and that my life would give glory to you, God. So fill me, God, with your power to grasp and understand all that you have for me. Baptize me afresh with the baptism of love, in Jesus' name, amen. That's a daring prayer. So here's what we're going to do as we sing this song. 
If you're here today and you say, Pastor, that was speaking to me today. I see the inconsistency in my life. I see the flesh overcoming the spirit. In my head, I know he loves me. But in my heart, sometimes I feel so dirty and inadequate. And I need to know the love of God. Because you know what, Pastor? I'm not sure my kids know how much they're loved because I can't give what I don't have. My husband, the people around me, I need a fresh baptism from on high. I need a fresh baptism from on high. So if you're that person, if you're saying I need to, it needs to go from more from here to here, I'm just, just going to ask that you do what the Apostle Paul said, that you just make your way forward and you get on your knees right here and said, here I am, Lord. I need a fresh baptism from on high. I don't want to know about your love. I want to know your love. I don't want to just know a little. I want to be flooded with that so that I can give what I've received. So before we sing this song, if you need to make your way forward, get on your knees and say, here I am, Lord. I'm asking that you would do that in my life. I'm here, Father. Give me power to grasp it. Lord, work in me.